Hi and welcome to Dark Rain True Crime Channel. In today's story, we're looking at the case of Nicola Edgington. Nicola was a very disturbed young girl, who although was clearly guilty of the crimes she committed, the authorities also have to take part of the blame for the atrocities that would later take place. Let me know your thoughts on the case at the end of the story. Nicola Edgington was born on September 9, 1980, and lived in East Grinstead, in West Sussex, with her father Harry, mother Marion, and her two younger siblings, brother Tom and sister Sarah. Nicola had a turbulent childhood, telling authorities that she was abused by her father when she was a young child, although no action was ever taken against him regarding her allegations, and he denied any abuse ever took place. She had frequent stays in care homes throughout her teenage years, after keep running away from home, and eventually would leave school with no qualifications. Nicola would go on to find work as a hairdresser, then a care assistant in a nursing home, but her life would take a turn for the worst, and spiral out of control after becoming addicted to drugs in her teenage years. Nicola's life then became very chaotic, she turned to prostitution, also working as a pole dancer, and ultimately became a drug dealer to fund her habit. At the age of 17, Nicola miscarried twins after being punched in the stomach by her then violent boyfriend, and then at 19, she was pregnant again, this time by her drug dealer boyfriend. She gave birth to a healthy baby boy, although he was three months premature. Nicola and her newborn son moved in with her mother Marion, who helped her care for the child until he was taken away by Child Protective Services. Nicola then married a Jamaican man and had another child, again this child was taken into the foster care system. The marriage was very turbulent and the pair soon parted ways, the Jamaican husband would eventually gain custody of both of Nicola's sons, and move them to Jamaica, to start a new life. Nicola moved to London, and her life over the next few years, was one of taking drugs, partying and drinking alcohol, and she became more and more estranged from her family, but did agree to meet up on a family get-together at her mother's home in Sussex, on November 4, 2005. Upon arriving in Sussex, she went to a pub for a drink with her brother Tom, but was thrown out because of her bizarre behavior, so returned to her mother's cottage. Upon returning, Nicola and her mother argued, Nicola blamed her mother for her children being taken into care, and she also just found out that her mother had taken her out of her will, and her brother and sister would share her part of the inheritance. It was during this argument, that Nicola would stab her mother nine times with a knife she got from the kitchen, killing her, and leaving her body in a pool of blood on the living room floor. Marion Edgington's body was found by her other two children Tom and Sarah, later that afternoon. Nicola fled back to London and went into hiding, but she was caught and arrested by police just three weeks later. During her trial, Nicola admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, saying she was suffering from a severe mental illness, and had no real memory of what happened that day. At Lewis Crown Court on 23 October 2006, the judge presiding, ordered that she be held in a secure hospital indefinitely. You would think that because she murdered her mother, and was seriously mentally ill, that she would be held in a secure hospital for a long period of time. But you're wrong, Nicola Edgington was released from custody less than three years later in September 2009, moving to a flat in Greenwich. What a fucking joke, stabbing your mother to death, and receiving 35 months in a cozy little hospital as punishment, whoever deemed this girl as safe for release, is pretty fucking shit at their job. Hospital staff also failed to take seriously the warnings made by her brother and sister, that Nicola was still unwell, and potentially dangerous. Greenwich police should have also been informed of her release, but the hospital trust failed to forward on the paperwork. After she was freed, Nicola was moved into free accommodation with low levels of supervision and was also allowed to visit her husband in Jamaica. I bet the bloody government paid for it as well. But her private life began to spiral out of control, and Nicola was unable to cope, as she stopped taking her medication in September 2011. She had hoped to make a new life, but a couple of romances went sour, mostly due to her erratic behavior. A former boyfriend from a local gym sent her abusive messages, she became pregnant but unfortunately had a miscarriage, and an attempt to reconnect with her family fell flat. She sent a message to her brother Tom saying, I'm missing mum badly, 
I have just had a miscarriage, and to be honest, no one is taking care of me like mum did. It ended, love you, kiss kiss kiss. But the reply from her brother read, you stabbed her to death, and left me to find her body. It's good news about your miscarriage, people like you should be sterilized. Do us all a favor and cut your wrists. Pretty harsh words from Tom, but what did she expect? At 4 a.m. on October 10, 2011, police were called to a taxi rank, when Nicola told cab office employees that she needed to be sectioned because of her mental state. Police officers failed to do a background check on the police national computer, which would have flagged up violence and manslaughter on her record. At 4.30 a.m., police officers take her to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Woolwich, when the officers go to leave, Nicola chases after them saying she doesn't want to be left alone. At 4.45 a.m., Nicola asks the receptionist, is it going to take for me to kill someone to be seen, as I've done it before. She was told to be patient. At 4.52 a.m., Nicola dials 999 and tells the emergency services, last time I felt like this, I killed someone, could you please send a car now? Police promise to send someone, but within five minutes, decide no attendance is required. 5.13 a.m., she calls 999 again, saying she is a murderer and wants to be arrested before she hurts someone. Within six minutes, police decide a visit is not required. 5.21 a.m., she dials 999 again, saying she is a dangerous schizophrenic, and if police don't arrive soon she is going to harm someone. The operator offers her no help, and police decide no attendance is necessary. It seems nobody wants to listen to her for Christ's sake. 5.27 a.m., dials 999 for the fourth time, asking to be arrested, and also wanting some medication before she kills someone, telling them that last time she felt this way she killed her mother. Police then phoned the hospital, who told them that the matter was in hand. 5.30 a.m., Nicola is finally assessed by a mental health nurse, and tells him she wants to be sectioned, he tells Nicola that she came in voluntary, so did not need sectioning. 6.30 a.m., Nicola is taken by security to Oxley's psychiatric unit at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. 6.40 a.m., a doctor from the unit says hello to Nicola, but does not carry out any face-to-face -face assessment of her. 7.06 a.m., Nicola pushes a faulty door in the secure unit, and simply walks out. Two nurses who claimed they pursued her, were later sacked after CCTV proved they didn't. They just let her go. At 7.19 a.m., the doctor from the unit calls the police, reporting that Nicola has absconded, then finally a criminal record check is carried out by the police. Probably a little bit late, but by now the police would have been worried, after ignoring her for so long. Nicola left the psychiatric unit, then took two buses to Bexley Heath, arriving in the town center around 8.25 a.m. She went straight into an Asda supermarket, where she would purchase a large kitchen knife. She can be seen holding the knife in a bag while she enters the ladies' toilets, upon leaving the toilets the knife is now concealed somewhere on her body. She left Asda and went to Bexley Heath High Street, where she attacked 22-year-old Kerry Clark, who was standing at a bus stop on her way to work. Kerry was stabbed, and fought for her life with everything she had. Kerry managed to fight Nicola off, and sustained serious but non-life-threatening injuries, due to a passerby intervening, and taking the knife from Nicola. Nicola fled the scene and ran into a nearby butcher's shop, and stole another knife, this time it was a professionally sharpened butcher's cleaver. She left the butcher's shop, and went looking for somebody else to attack. The next person she bumped into, was 58-year-old Sally Hodkirk, who after being late for her bus, had to travel in Nicola's direction to catch the train to work. Nicola carried out a vicious and frenzied attack on poor Sally, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was attacked so savagely, that she was almost decapitated, and a meat cleaver was left embedded in her neck. Nicola fled the scene, but a man CCTV station in Bexley Heath was following her every move, and after trying to hide in a DIY store, she was arrested nearby and taken into custody.
According to psychiatrists, Nicola was having paranoid delusions and hallucinations, with a religious subtext. She believed a 100-eyed monster was guarding the throne of God against enemies, and saw shops looking like a nuclear holocaust had taken place. She believed Jesus had come back to save everyone's souls except hers, which she couldn't understand because she loved God. She also felt she was in a computer simulation, and had various bizarre beliefs relating to famous figures and films. On 7 February 2013, at the Old Bailey, Nicola Edgington was convicted by a jury of the attempted murder of Kerry Clark, and of the murder of Sally Hodkin. Judge Brian Barker jailed her for life on 4 March 2013, with a minimum term of 37 years. In a statement read out to court, Sally Hodkin's husband Paul, said there was not a day since the attack that he had not cried. He said the day he heard she had been killed, was when my world fell apart. The thought of not seeing her again has destroyed me, he said. Over 40 years of marriage were brought to an end by someone who shouldn't have been on our streets. His solicitor, Daniel Rubinstein, said outside court that the family would be considering further action as questions remained over the authorities' actions. And rightly so, the authorities fucked up big time. I think Nicola Edgington deserves the 37 years she got for the murder of Sally, but how many times did she have to ask for help before police would listen to her? The only time a background check was done was when she absconded from the secure unit, and by then it was far too late. I'm not an expert on mental health, but this girl was having problems and it shouldn't matter if she's got a history of violence or not. Anyone suffering from mental health problems should be listened to and dealt with immediately. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Thanks so much for watching, please like the video to help get it seen, and hit that subscribe button if you like this sort of content. Hope to see you in the next one.